Hi everyone, um, I'm Tom Stitt. I work at LNL. I am a software developer on a project called Marble, which is one of our production physics simulation applications. Um, so I'm going to talk today about, it's a little bit different than what we've maybe seen before, but we are trying to extend our command line interface to use Jupyter Notebooks as an interface option. Um, so first, some acknowledgments. Uh, big thanks to Thomas Mendoza, who I don't know if he's here right now, but he presented yesterday. Without him, we wouldn't really be able to do Jupyter on our computing network. Um, I want to thank the Marble team, uh, because without them, I wouldn't have a code to play with. And all of you guys, plus everyone else who isn't here from the Jupyter community, for making such a great product. So Marble is um, a high energy density physics application, simulation application. Um, it's built off two other applications. I'm not really going to go into detail, but uh, it uses um, C++ Fortran. It's all MPI based. Um, and it has the shared layer of C++ and Lua at the top. So our users write code in Lua to define their input problems. And then also, if they want to um, use a shell with our application, they have a Lua shell. So uh, a lot of you probably already know how applications are run at these HPC facilities, but uh, I'll give a little brief overview again. So one of the modes is batched. And batched is basically you write this script that defines your resource needs. So maybe how many nodes you need, how long you want it to run, if you need GPUs or not. Um, and you submit it to this batch system. The batch system, whenever it has resources available, will put your code onto the resources that's allocated for you. It runs for a while. Your application will dump checkpoints, both for if you want to look at how your code is progressing, um, but also if your code crashes, you can restart from the intermediate state. Um, another option, if it's available, is an interactive. Um, interactive is more of like you're dropped into a shell. You can say run for 100 time steps, maybe query some values, maybe create some visualizations if your code supports it. So our production applications widely vary. Some are only batch, some have interactive custom language, some are interactive Python. Um, for Marble, like I said, this is Lua. We have tab complete history. And we use an application called GeoViz to allow inline visualization so you can visualize the density field and interact with it. But to use this, you have to start a visualization server, configure Marble to look where the visualization server is, and then in the interactive shell say, OK, I want to visualize the energy field. And, and X windows will pop up and you can interact with that. But it's a little uh, clunky sometimes and very slow if you are on VPN. Um, so we were thinking when I started, um, some other people have been thinking about what do we want after the CLI? How do we give users a richer experience? Um, there are some initial mockups, which is using some open source web terminal just to connect from a browser to the app. Um, but I thought Jupyter might be a good fit. Um, and especially with Jupyter Lab, we're very interested in having that be the entire space for the user to um, do their workflow. So if they want to make their mesh, and maybe that's a command line only tool, they can do that at the terminal. They can write their input deck in the um, file editor, and then they can run Marble in a notebook, um, to connect and visualize and do data analytics. So, uh, these are the two modes we see. So in batch, we want to be able to do something called what we call attachable diagnostics. So in the case that your simulation is running for two weeks, you might want to connect to it, um, maybe like seven days in, um, pause the simulation, and then maybe query some values, maybe do some visualization. Uh, you could modify a boundary condition, add a source, map it on it to a different mesh, and then regenerate the problem line and keep running. Uh, this feature doesn't exist for applications we have now. Um, you could take one of your checkpoints, kill your job, restart from that checkpoint while changing some parameters, but that isn't as um, clean, especially if it's difficult for you to get an allocation you want to you know, keep using the one you have. Um, interactively, this is more 
what we see with notebooks now. Um, so maybe tutorials, or if you just want to grab a shell or a notebook, explore the application, um, and then the share, shareable, reproducible, run documents. Uh, this is just some of the GIF. So I don't do live demos um, with VPN, so they probably will just fail miserably. Um, this is just using Matplotlib to show it hooking up to Marble, so we can do 1D curves. People are interested in this, so they want to see the evolution of their time step. Um, this is just showing grabbing some NumPy data from our application and plotting it, uh, sort of basic. Um, this is another example. This is using GeoViz, but a widgetized JavaScript version of it um, to do inline analysis. So you can, as you see, um, show that up the GIF because I type slow. But you can select a field, plot it, interact. You can click and drag, uh, zoom in out. There's some keyboard options you can do to um, like display the mesh, display the axis, show the elements. Um, pretty neat. Um, I'll talk on this more if there's time. That app is actually transpiled or compiled within Scripten from the C++ OpenGL to a WebGL WebAssembly thing. Um, we had a summer student work on that. It works pretty well. It's pretty amazing what you can do. So brief, Thomas went over this yesterday. What does Jupyter look like at LNL? We have Jupyter Hub. It launches notebook servers on login nodes. Um, security is important, as he went over. So we require everything to be Unix domain sockets so that um, other people on the login node can't eavesdrop. Because um, even if you're on the same login nodes, maybe you aren't the same Unix groups, so you don't have the same permission to view data. Um, so that's important to us. So, when I first started looking at how do we um, bridge the notebook code gap, um, these are some challenges or considerations I came up with. So for us, basically all our jobs are non-local. So maybe Marvel is massively parallel. It could be running on, it could be running single um, core, but it could be running on um, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of cores, depending on who's running it. Um, and since our notebook servers are a login node and our code is on our compute node, we need a way to connect the two. Um, we use MPI applications. A lot of, or all of the existing kernels I've seen are serial. Maybe they use threads, maybe they use GPUs, but um, multi-process in the MPI sense um, could be hard to integrate for some of the kernels. Um, security, very important, as I went over. Um, as Thomas showed yesterday, you can eavesdrop. You can't like connect and execute code, but you can definitely, if anyone else is sending data over TCP, you can listen to that. So we need some way to encrypt messaging if we're gonna use TCP um, and make sure that uh, no one can connect to your kernel or backend that isn't allowed. Um, integration, so we have Intel machines and we have IBM machines and so portability is important for us. One of the big reasons we use Lua is because it's difficult to um, compile Python on IBM machines. A lot of things are hard to compile on IBM machines, but we want something without a lot of dependencies so it can move from one machine to the other without uh, a lot of headache. So this was my first attempt at doing this. Um, before we even had Jupyter on LNL, I was opening, a, I was running a Jupyter notebook server on my laptop, creating a forwarding tunnel to our um, either login or compute node and just connecting over that. Um, and the Jupyter protocol was intimidating to me and there wasn't a C++ kernel. So I, of course, wrote my own small thing, um, not as featureful, but it put all of our considerations we have here first above anything else. Um, so basically the code creates a runtime certificate, drops some data, you grab it on the client side, the client side automatically opens tunnels, um, and all communication is signed and both the client and the server can authenticate each other. Um, this is a screenshot, there'll be a GIF demo on the next slide. But basically what this is, is it's a widget that opens and looks in a well-known location for a list of backends that are available. So here we have some marble run, um, it's using TCP, encrypted TCP. Uh, once it started, code name, connect, it 
displays a lot of verbose information. You can do some stuff. So what this lets us do is the connectable diagnostics. So you can run your code in a batch partition, which will be running for a while. You open this up, you say connect, you list, you can connect to it, it'll pause your simulation. You are now in a notebook connected to your simulation that is paused. You can do some stuff. And when you disconnect, the code keeps running. Um, yes, automatic tunneling, automatic encryption, authentication encryption, uh, and good support for MPI. This also only uses OpenSSL and POSIX libraries. So um, IBM actually has OpenSSL on it by default. So it was easy to bring over between the machines. Um, here's a demo of it. So here's a terminal running on our computing network on a node called RZ Genie. And so I'm just starting. It's running, taking time steps. So I go up to the notebook. Um, Stable backends, connect to it. Oh, it's connected. Uh, you can see it say, okay, now I'm waiting for stuff. Um, all the um, commands are run, are also printed here. Take some time steps, print some more stuff. And then Okay, you're done, you disconnect, and it keeps running, you can close your notebook server, good to go. Um, so this gives us the attachable diagnostics workflow that we wanted. Um, so, uh, you mean in the code? Yeah. Ah, so that's all tab complete, or it's a loop. It's just a Lua cell shell. So you can just say like, print me everything in a global state. And just um, so that's the tab complete right there, if you saw some of it. Um, so the good attachable diagnostics is developed with MPI in mind, so it's very easy to integrate. Um, only used OpenSSL and POSIX, which we have everywhere. Bad, as you saw, it's a multi-step workflow. So if you want to share a notebook with someone, it sucks. Um, if you want to make a tutorial, it sucks. You have to like start the code, open this notebook, open a widget, find your instance, connect and do stuff. Um, so along the way, uh, some people were complaining that they don't know Lua and that we should have a Python shell too. Because um, a lot of our legacy production codes are Python and a lot of our um, users use Python for other stuff. So I looked at how do we get Python without duplicating all our Lua source because we use, we, not, we use Lua not just for input problems, but also for some of the um, user interface development. So there's this project called Lupa, which uh, just bridges between Python and Lua. So you expose your Lua state to Python, you expose Python objects to Lua. So in Python, you can say, Lewis state dot simulation dot time step or dot blast dot kinetic energy. You can get tab complete. So it looks like you have this Python dictionary, Python object that's really a Lua object. Works quite well. Um, and because we now have both embedded Lua and embedded Python, we can use IPyKernel's embed kernel to actually embed a native IPython kernel without much work at all. Um, so this worked. I don't know if I have a picture here. Um, so with this in mind, we created two new extensions of the IPython kernel, just an MPI Python and MPI Lua kernel. Um, the master rank runs the normal kernel. There's every other rank runs a little loop that just waits for your execute or evaluation requests um, and executes them. So it's a little bit hacky. It works OK. Or I haven't run into issues, but um, I perceive people trying to use it and having it crash. Um, every time the user runs the code using this mode of kernels, they get a URL printed to the screen that they can copy and paste into their browser, which opens a notebook. That uses another extension we developed called NV Connect Existing, which is an extension for the notebook server to connect to existing kernels. Um, automatically opens tunnels if you need them. Uh, and we also get access to widgets, which is important because of that visualization application I showed you earlier. So good and bad. 
good normal workflow. So you can actually go into notebook server application or Jupyter Lab, click new, click marble, you're there. Of course, that's only serial, uh, but it works for tutorials. It works for if someone wants to explore the code, just like tab complete, um, look at you know the structures that define their input or look at the various um, more dynamic structures like our simulation object. Um, we have a documentation, a Sphinx based documentation. We can include links in that documentation and open notebooks. So you can say, oh, I want to learn about how our events or our simulation or our um, 1D curve saving objects work. You can click on a link, it opens a notebook, you can follow the tutorial, um, better than a big block of text and static code. Uh, as we saw, we use matplotlib, so it's easy to inject matplotlib in. Everything is using the IPython kernel, so even the Lua kernel, you can have, you can inject into the Lua namespace a function called plot that just uses matplotlib on the back end, and Lupa does the variable conversion for you. And of course, widgets. Um, bad attachable diagnostics is hard. Um, we haven't actually, I haven't actually found a way to do this. So I said you can connect to non-local jobs, but the job cannot have started running and then pause on connect. Um, we're using the IPython kernel where interrupts are signal based and we would really need to use message based interrupts for non-local jobs unless we have some weird SSH tunnel signal command that runs. So that is uh, a very limiting factor. MPI support is a bit hacky. Like I said, we're just um, having two very separate blocks of code so it can be hard to reason about. Um, and we've had people, either when building our code or running our code, some uh, local Python, um, something in their local Python path or something in their local library and mess things up. A lot of legacy codes will have you on a script that will set up Python path in a weird way. And so when you try to run our stuff, it crashes. So either it doesn't build or it doesn't run. Um, so conclusions, what do people think? Uh, so we wanted to embed notebooks or use notebooks as a front end to get a much, much richer set of features. Um, and then when we saw Jupyter Lab, we're thinking, oh, this could be like the one-stop shop for a workflow. Um, like I said, you, users sometimes need to run command line tools that don't have or don't foresee any support for a Jupyter front end. Um, users might need to allocate their jobs in a very special way. So maybe we could think about batch spawner, but I'm not someone on the, um, like the service side. I don't have a lot of say in that. Um, the connecting to existing kernels can be tricky. Uh, so if you don't have, if in the demo everything works, but if you don't have SSH key set up, stuff fails and some users don't understand what our SSH keys are, how to set them up. Um, and we don't have a lot of users. So a lot of our users are also developers or they're some sort of developers. So they might have a little bit more experience with um, actually coding in Python, actually coding in C++. And so they might, uh, they're more flexible and willing to step through the problems that they encounter. Um, when we have users who are just like physicists who just want to use our code, maybe they won't be as flexible. Maybe they won't want to even change their workflow. So it's to be seen whether or not people will adopt this. Um, future work, we want something that does the attachable diagnostics like the bridge kernel and the, I just want to start a kernel on the uh, notebook server or Jupyter lab interface. So maybe a Zeus kernel, um, it's in C++. I feel much more confident about hacking on that and adding MPI support. Um, it supports widget protocols, so we could just add a C++ um, sir, kernel implementation of our widget. Uh, and because we wouldn't be building with um, Python, we wouldn't worry about user environments screwing up our builds and screwing up our startup. Um, here are some references. Um, thanks. All right, we've got time for a couple of questions. So, first off, 
think it is very interesting. Um, as somebody who works at a super computing center, I really uh, promote uh, ways for users to check in on their jobs and see how they're doing. Yeah. Um, two quick questions. You're not using the name shifted interface for API to identify. Can you repeat that? You're not intercepting with the eyeball? No. Okay. Fair enough. Um, to, so so um, I guess it's not clear to me how, how you would interrupt a running MPI code. And, and that's a minor thing, but the other, the other thing would be the, you know, the PMPI, uh, the name shifted interface to MPI. Um, any globally synchronized and collected there would be an excellent intersection point if you want to uh, to, uh, to grab control. Of the okay. So we're actually using a separate thread on the master rank that's listening to our socket. Yeah, do, doing it from outside is only on the master rank. I can also, I have a couple more slides on the um, inscript and widget if people are interested in that too. There are no other questions. I mean, have you thought about um, other pieces that you think could be pulled out and made general for events? Or yeah, because I can see this. A common scenario is I'm running some kind of larger application and I want to use you know, a notebook to visualize a roadmap. So there's a project called Ascent. Um, Cyrus Harris and Matt Larson, if you know those names, they are using part of the bridge kernel stuff with their Python um, interface to Ascent so that any code that uses Ascent can request the code to stop and then give information back to a notebook. And that's limited to stuff Ascent knows about. So it's mostly visualization. Um, actually updating the run state would be just... A-S-C-E-N-T. Yeah, there's a link in the references if you want to look at it. Um, what is it? I mean, if correct, I can see this being usable, you know, not just the notebooks, but other kind of frameworks that can collect with running simulations too. Yeah. Um, Very cool. Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna, I'll just go over quick what we did with, um, let's see, do I have time? No, you know, like, you know, four minutes. Perfect. Um, I just wanna go over this. Uh, this is something that could be useful to some of you who have C++ applications you want to be widgets. Um, we had a summer student come in. Okay, let me go over GLviz first. So GLviz and OpenGL, um, X Windows, C++ visualization application. I talked about it earlier, it does, server-based visualization. So you run a server, you connect your application to the server, you send requests and it performs visualization over X windows. Um, BLAST, which is our um, arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian um, hydro package, uses higher order um, AL meshes or full Lagrange meshes. Um, and the thing about GeoViz, it uses MFEM if you've heard of MFEM, but it um, natively renders higher order fields meshes um, so we don't have to uh, project it onto a lower order um, representation of the object so that's nice uh, my gift demo i don't think sure showed the nice curved elements but can do that um, so we had a summer student last summer called named max yang who basically took this um c plus application and used opengl 1.4 Upgraded it to 2.1 because Inscripten doesn't work so well with the fixed function pipeline. Um, added some Inscripten specific things and just transpiled it into a WebAssembly library. Um, and that WebAssembly library was just wrapped like you would a normal JavaScript library as a widget. Um, the only tricky thing is there was like a one tricky thing because the Inscripten JavaScript object wants to intercept all keys. So you have to make sure that you tell it oh, only accept if, like, uh, listen to keys in the cell that the widget is in. Um, it's a, a open source. It's hasn't been developed a whole lot. Um, I plan to do some more uh, Python side stuff, but 
yeah, it was successful, um, except, I mean, he had to modify like 6,000 lines of code. So it was very impressive on that front. Um, but if you have an OpenGL 2.1 plus application, you can consider converting it to a widget pretty easily. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah.